Good afternoon. Today we're going to show how to use InfraWorks to generate isometric renderings using project data for public involvement exhibits. There are various different types of public involvement exhibits that can be used for different types of projects. And I'm just going to go through a, a few examples of different uh, ex exhibits that can be used. Um, first are sort of just generally, you know, black and white um, aerial views um, of, of the project, um, either big long roll plots or smaller exhibits. Um, these are probably the most commonly type, common type used. Um, they're easy for engineers to understand, but a lot of people who aren't familiar with highway design have a hard time understanding them um, and have, have a hard time understanding where their property is and what the impacts will be. Um, Another type that's pretty commonly used now is to have a plan view exhibit, but to put an aerial photo behind it, um, which makes it a little easier for uh, the general public to understand um, where their houses or where other common objects are that are easy to understand. Um, and this makes it easy to see where some of the right-of-way impacts are and where tree impacts are um, and those kind of things, but still kind of hard for a lot of people to understand that plan view because they don't really ever see their house from a, a plan view. They're most, more used to looking at it from driving down the street or standing in their yard. Um, the plan views are still necessary just to show the real estate impacts and the construction impacts. Um, Another option that we've used on a lot of projects is to have um, photorealistic rendering. So this was one that was done about 10 years ago for a project um, in the city of Milwaukee. And this was done using older methods with Navisworks and 3ds Max, and it was extremely labor intensive to put together. The final result is a very good high quality rendering, but most projects there isn't the budget to put together this level of rendering. This takes weeks worth of time um, to accomplish this, to get a photo like this. Um, it starts off with, in this case, someone went, went out in a bucket truck and took a photo. And then all of the rendering was done using CAD line work, but essentially modeled by hand in 3D modeling software. Um, by someone who does this on a regular basis. And, you know, the end result is very high quality, but extremely labor intensive. And the biggest downside is you, ha you have to select the exact location you're going to use for your rendering before you start. Um, and when this picture had to be taken, you pretty much get one chance of taking it because um, you have to coordinate the use of the bucket truck to get the proper angle. Recently, within the last couple of years, we've done a, a few of these where we have now used InfraWorks to create a pretty high quality exhibit that um, can be used at P in public meetings that when we've used have been extremely popular and easy for people to understand. Um, it's more from an angle that people can can visualize what the impacts are and and how their house relates to the project and, and how it'll look when it's done. Um, the nice thing about InfraWorks is if the design changes, you can easily update the rendering to come up with what the, the new result is quickly rather than with the photorealistic renderings. It could take you know, weeks to update again once that um, once some, you know, a, little, a little minor change comes through. Uh, the other advantage is you don't have to pick your exact angle. So when, as you're making your model, you'll have an idea of how what angle you want and what, what sort of what direction you want to face, but if once the rendering is done, you decide that another angle looks better, it's just literally a matter of rotating the view and taking another snapshot and your rendering is, is updated again without tons and tons of work to update the rendering. And the nice thing about the InfraWorks model too is the level of detail um, can easily be modified to fit kind of the, the level that you need. Um, obviously, the earlier in the design process you are, the less detail you're going to have to put into the model. Um, and depending on the type of project you have, the scale of how zoomed in or out you want to be, obviously, the further out you're zoomed, the less detail you're going to want to show because it's just not going to sh show up on a 24 by 36 exhibit during a public meeting or in a, in a screenshot that ends up on a, uh, on a website. So for, for this case, the project was a standalone roundabout. 
Um, so we we rendered the entire project um, since we only went about four or 500 feet down each leg of the intersection. At this time, the project was about a little more than 60% complete um, in the Sybil 3D models for the project were about 90% complete. So we had a pretty good finished top surface to work with. Um, if you're trying to do these rent type of renderings for kind of an earlier part of the process, you know, if you're before 30%, you might not have as high quality of renderings. And you can still do these. You just may want to be a little more zoomed out or just understand that you might not have as much detail in the model. And to be honest, the average person from the public probably isn't going to sit there and be able to, unless it's something really glaring, find those. It's one of those where you know it's not 100% correct, but the average person, as long as it looks pretty good, isn't going to really know if some of your side slopes aren't perfect or some of the way, some of the blending of certain things comes together isn't exactly perfect. So just real quick list of just the data that's needed to complete a rendering like this. Um, you'll need an existing surface of the project area that's surveyed. Um, if it's more of a planning level, you may not have this. Um, you can use some of the topography that's generated with within InfraWorks, but having that existing surface really helps to especially if you have ditches to define those, because a lot of times the bigger GIS uh, aerial photogrammetry doesn't pick up some of the ditches and some of those details. Um, you'll also want to have a finished top surface of the project to show what the final surface is going to look like within the roadway. Um, you're going to need a plan view AutoCAD drawing of the proposed improvements, and you want to have a 3D AutoCAD drawing of any city furniture that's not in the stock InfraWorks catalog. So most of those are going to be um, signs. Um, and in some cases, you may have some other three-dimensional objects that are specific to your project that you want to include. So signal poles, light poles, depending on the type of project, if there's some really critical um, building or some other feature that's along there, you may want to spend the time to develop a three-dimensional model of that object that you can then put directly into the InfraWorks model. Big thing is just to sit down and think before you start the rendering and come up with a plan of a specific area you're looking to render. If you've got you know a long linear project, it's not really realistic to render the entire project. Um, usually there's just not a the project budget. And in this case, we're, we're looking at just a photo rendering. Um, there is the ability to do a video rendering down through a project. Um, we're not, there's not enough time to cover that today, but um, generally with these photo renderings, you're not going to be able to show enough detail for you know, a mile or a mile and a half long project. So you're going to pick you know, one area or a couple areas and worry about putting the detail together for those. And the big thing is just focusing on those details that can be seen in the rendering. So that if there's some detail about a fence that's half a mile down the road, don't worry about something like that. Worry about sort of what's in the foreground that can easily be seen in the rendering. So now we'll jump into uh, InfraWorks. So when you open up InfraWorks, um, there's a couple of, if you've never used it before, there's just a couple stock projects. So what we're going to want to go to is the model builder. So you'll want to search by location, so either type in the area or you can zoom in. So in this case, we're going to be in southern Milwaukee County. And one thing you need to think about is kind of how far out, depending on the angle, you're going to be able to see. Um, so the lower the angle you have, the further away you can see. Um, so you're going to want to make sure you have some additional area that's re rendered within the model to start with so that you can see the topography there. Otherwise, if you, if you take too small of a tile, you'll just end up seeing kind of a generic grayish bluish colored background. So. There's multiple different options to pick your area of interest. You can either just take what's in the screen. You can draw a rectangle to select the area of interest. You can draw a polygon or you can import a polygon. So if there's a very specific area, you could go into CAD, draw that area as a shape and then import that. So in this case, we'll just use a rectangle and I'm just gonna pick basically a, a mile away. 
each direction. And so we'll just call this, you have to just give it a name. Click create model. And so what it's going to do is it's going to prepare the new model and it's going to take several minutes. Um, so once it does this, it'll pop up on your home screen. And it'll also send you an email. And so while this is rendering and creating the model, we'll jump into CAD um, and come up with all the different pieces we're going to need to put together. So the first is we'll, we'll go through and worry about the existing surface. So here we have an existing DTM of the project area. So I'll just go to the triangle style just so you can see. It's field surveyed, so it has more detail than you would get from an aerial mapping flight or sort of the GIS DEM data that, that's within uh, InfraWorks. So one thing to keep in mind is you need to make sure you have a coordinate system attached to any file you're bringing in. So InfraWorks works in latitude and longitude. And so generally with projects, you're working either in county coordinates or state plane coordinates. This project happens to be in state plane coordinates. So to set your coordinates, if you're not familiar with it, if you go to your tool space under settings, if you just go to that drawing, right click and go to edit drawing settings, you can set your, your datum within that drawing. So in this case, we're Wisconsin State Plane Coordinate System. So you can go to USA, Wisconsin, and we are Wisconsin State Plane South Zone US Foot. Actually, it's WIS. I know it's the coordinate system for this one, so it's then 8027. So you can click OK, and now a coordinate system is assigned to your drawing. Typically, now we aren't assigning coordinate systems to drawings within WISDOT projects, um, but you'll have to at least temporarily assign the coordinate system to be able to export files from Civil 3D into InfraWorks. So, for an existing surface, we'll want to convert that file to a land XML. So the way to do that is just within Civil 3D, if you go to your output tab um, in the export ribbon, there's export to land XML. It's going to pop up everything within the drawing will be selected. So you just unselect it, everything and just click what you're looking to have. Click OK. You can name your surface, click Save. And that will, in this case, we'll just Save it. It's the existing surface. And now the existing surface has been saved. And now we'll go back and now now this has popped up. So it's it's created the model. So if you just double click on it, it'll download the model and open it up. The first time it'll take a few minutes as it's loading all of the information in. So now you'll see we have the tile and of the area we looked for. So our subject intersection is going to be right in the middle of the tile. And you can see sevens there's a quarry nearby, so you can see there is a DEM that's been downloaded with it that drapes the aerial photo onto that DEM so you can, it's pretty obvious here because of the, the quarry that there's some relief and you can kind of, if you zoom down to the road level, you can see, you know, there's a berm here. Um, but because it's a DEM, it doesn't have as much data necessarily as with the ditches. And in this case, this project is under construction. The photo was taken. Um, you can see also the component roads are in here as well as some streams. Um, we don't need the component roads or the streams in this case. Those are used for more of a preliminary design and analysis that most people use InfraWorks for. Um, so what we'll do is we'll go up to the display tab and under the surface layers, we'll just turn off roads, water areas and waterways, click apply, and it'll regenerate the model and we're just down to an aerial photo. So now we're going to look to import that, ex that existing surface. Um, and I've also already done the same, th same thing with creating XML, the finished surface. So in this case, you're going to go to data, data sources. And it'll pop up a box that will show different ways of 
um, different things that could be imported as data sources. So in this case, you'll click the first icon on the top left, and this will give you all the different options of different file types you can import. So in our case, we want to import a land XML file. Go out and find that file. So select your existing surface, and you'll see it pops in here. And so what you have to do with any surface that you import is just double click on it and it'll pop up and it'll say what coordinate system it is. Always check when any any time you import anything, check your coordinate system and make sure that it matches. One thing it'll show is it's the train. In this case, you can't click and change that, um, but just click close and refresh and now it'll actually add it in. So we'll do the same thing with our finished top surface. and refresh. So now you'll see it's still not showing up. So what you have to do is go into your surface layers and you'll see that under terrain surfaces, both those surfaces we added are considered uncategorized. So to make them categorized, what you need to do is just grip and slide it down onto ground surface and now the order matters. So with any of the any anything with the renderings that we're doing, whether it's going to be the surfaces or any of the coverage areas we're going to create, the order that they're listed is kind of the build order. So the the lowest is kind of the lowest layer. So you want to have in this case, we want to have the DEMs of the overall. So that just happens there's two of them. We want those to be at the bottom because that's the much larger air outside project area. We want to have our existing surface, and then we want to have our top surface and you'll see that these are on the light bulbs are checked off so you also want to make sure those are checked on click apply and click OK so now you can see there's some more ditching that was added in here and now you can actually see the surface for the finished roundabout in here so now we have all of our terrain in here so now we have our terrain surfaces that we can use so now the next step is to start bringing in what are called coverage areas. So that would be any kind of material we want to bring in that is going to be visually shown. So you want to go into Civil 3D and create a new file, make sure it has the coordinate system attached. Now I've already gone ahead and made most of the areas, but all you really need to do is go in and turn on your pavement file or your slope intercept file. And what I do is I create a new layer for every material type. So we'll start off with just the slope intercepts and so we'll isolate that layer out. So what I've done is just gone around and where the slope intercept is and drawn in a line, a closed polyline around the entire slope intercepts because we'll want to we'll want to have that shown as in this case a grass color. And because of how InfraWorks layers things, rather than having to draw a separate area for any grass outside of the roadway or the curb and gutter or the sidewalk, you can just draw one large overall area that can then be rendered. And as other layers of pavement and curb and gutter are put on top of it, it will clip those areas out that aren't going to be grass any longer. So that's one way of minimizing the number of shapes you have to bring in. Um, so in this case, this would be our slope intercept. Once you can see then, you know, the next layer I would render would be the, uh, the asphalt. So you'll see if I isolate that layer out. Same thing. I didn't worry about any of the medians or the, um, or the central island of the roundabout. I have the asphalt pavement for the roadway. And then in this case, we have three asphalt driveways that will be added in as well. So for curb and gutter, what I what I typically do is I'll just you just draw an outline of each each run of curb and gutter. And in this case, if you have an island that's going to be completely concrete, you can just fill the whole island in. And in this case, this is the central island. And this will be the central island curb that's on the inside of it. So in our case, we've got multiple different coverage areas. So we'll have one for our slope intercepts, one for our asphalt areas. We have some sidewalk. We'll have all the different concrete areas. We'll have there's some gravel shoulders. We have some red decorative concrete. 
Um, there's some grass in the central island, and then we have the detectable warning fields. So if I unisolate the layer, as you go through, you can see all the different shapes that are in here. So I recommend putting each material type or each each time you want to import something on a separate layer so it's easy to isolate out like that because the next step we have to do is to go through and create a shape file for each material type. So if we go back to this, so we'll turn off the pavement file just to make it easy to see everything. So if I go to my slope intercepts, isolate that back out. And so we want to create a, a shape file of this of this shape. And so this is where the coordinate system comes in again to make sure you got that assigned because that gets assigned to the shape file as well. So the easiest way to create a shape file is to just type in map export into the command line. And we'll, you would just name it. Um, so you would click slope intercept and we'll just make sure it's called something else so you don't overwrite the one I've already got created. And so this box will pop up. Um, so under the selection tab that pops up, you'll have the option for an object type of either a point, a line, a polygon, or text. In this case, we want it to be a polygon and we want to select manually. So you would select that polyline. If you had multiples, you would select multiple and then you would go to the options tab. And so we want to leave anything with the coordinate conversion unchecked and we want to click treat close polylines as polygons so that they're treated as polygons when they're imported into InfoWorks. And then you would click OK and it'll then create a shape file. So you'll do the same thing for every different material type that you're looking to generate. So if we go back into InfraWorks, then we'll want to then bring those in. So what I would recommend doing is just creating a, a list beforehand of the order you want them imported in. You can change them once they're in, um, but it's just good. To, I think it's easiest just to import them in the order you're looking for to have them sort of for final. So what we'll do is on when the data sources window, instead of using a land XML, we'll go to a shape file. Go to where and so like when I usually and I create models, I'll I'll separate them out by the coverage areas I want and pavement marking and just break in any 3D objects just so it's a little easier to find uh, as you start getting longer lists of shape files just so it's easy to find. So the first thing we're looking for is the slope intercept. So click open and you'll see it, it defaults to no feature. Um, so any any time you import a shape file, it's going to do that because it can be shape files could be multiple things. So you just double click on that shape file you just inserted. So you'll see now the type is listed as empty. So you would go to coverage areas. And so what you want to do is under the style, it'll say rule style empty. You click on the little pencil to edit and choose a style. And this will pop up a box that has all the different styles that InfraWorks has within it. So you can pick specific materials, material groups that they've got kind of pre-made for streets and roads or just a plain color. So this just has your 256, you know, I guess, you know, I guess be more than that, but just your RGB color. Um, you can pick any color within there if you'd like. Um, so if, you, if we go back to materials, so for slope intercept, just so happens I know if I want to go to terrain, so I guess it will go back here and you can see there's just under materials, there's different things for, you know, both categorized by bike path and bridge so within bridge there's different materials so you can even you know they've got materials for like MSE panels poured concrete brick um, different preset colors they have um, fence and barrier they've got like a wooden fence if you're looking for that you can create your own custom fences land cover they'll have a whole bunch of different from you know different grasses or cobblestones uh, under roadway, there's a whole bunch of different variations of concrete and asphalt and brick that you can use. Um, the one we'll end up using is in the terrain, be grass too. And this all comes down to personal preference and what you're looking to show. So we'll add that in. We'll click close and refresh. And now you'll see for that whole shape now, 
it's created that shape with grass. So you can now you can see with with the coloring, you can kind of see now the terrain. So you can see the curb. Um, you can see all the slopes. You can kind of see that there's sort of some low depression in that area. Um, this is an urban project, so we have a little bit of ditching you can see. Um, so the next layer we're gonna want to import then is our asphalt areas. Again, we'll go up the type, change it to coverage areas, change the rule style. So in this case, under material, under parking area, there's a dark gray asphalt. Um, so there's a lot of different concrete and asphalt patterns in here. Um, so you kind of have to play around with um, which one you think looks the best for your project. Um, and I've actually found, depending on the color of your aerial in the background, um, especially with asphalt, different colors of asphalt look better than others of how dark they are. Um, this aerial was just updated since I created the original rendering, so it's a little darker green. The original one I created had a little more of a yellowy color to it. Um, so some of the colors I would probably choose differently this time, um, just so that they look better. So a lot of this is, is just personal preference. So now you can see by creating this, you can see now that the roadway is now added in. So it clips out any of the green um, that's within the asphalt areas. Um, and if for some reason you would import, once in a while I'll forget to do this, where I'll, I'll, I'll update the coverage areas, but I'll forget to associate a rule style. What'll happen is it'll just show up and it'll be there'll be no color to it. Um, what you can do then is just double click back in the box and click on rule style again and then hit close and refresh and that'll it'll update it again. So if you don't do it right on import, um, you still can change it later. So after this, we'll want to add our sidewalk areas. Again, we'll change to coverage areas and for the concrete under parking area. There's a gray concrete. So now you can see the the side paths along the roundabout have been added. Next areas we call concrete areas. So this is the curb and gutter, um, the median islands. So we'll change these up to city or the coverage areas. Same thing, we'll use the gray concrete in the parking area folder. So this now is brought in the curb and gutter, these islands. And so in this case, this island will eventually have red concrete, gray curb and gutter, and then grass on the inside. But we can just draw in one circle to color this all in to start with, rather than trying to worry about creating um, a shape that just delineates the curb. So next we'll bring in the gravel shoulders. So we'll go to gravel area shape file. Type coverage areas again. The rule style this time we'll go to terrain and gravel. Close and refresh. And now it's drawn in the gravel shoulder. So you can see now you know, similar similar colors but you can see there's as you zoom in there's a little a little bit different variation and part of this comes into knowing how detailed you're going to be um, if you're zoomed out far enough you're probably not going to even be able to tell the difference between the gravel and the concrete you could save some time probably and just create all one big area because it all looks kind of gray um, that's part of just planning ahead of time and just kind of knowing kind of what scale you're looking for Next is going to be um, red concrete areas. So we'll click on our red concrete areas. Change to coverage areas. In this under colors, you can either go to materials, or sorry, the colors. You can either pick a color. So in this case, we'll just pick sort of a, a brick red and you could fine tune that then you know we could select a little a little bit darker 
And part of that's going to be that background color. Um, and eventually we can adjust the time of the day. Um, so it's going to depend on the lighting, just about what color you're looking to use. So we'll just add this in for now. So this is probably a little bit too much fire engine red for what we're really looking for, but we'll, we'll run with this for now. Next will be the central island curb. And so now you can see it clipped out on the inside. So now we want to clip out the red on the interior inside the truck apron. So we'll go back to coverage areas and then under rule style. We'll go to, in this case, it's parking area, gray concrete. Close and refresh. And now you can see it clipped out the red. And so we're just locked with a gray circle on the middle. Next will be the grass for the central island. Again, we'll double click on it, change to coverage areas, rule style, we'll go to material, terrain, grass two, quick close and refresh. And so now we have the central island grass. And then the last is going to be the detectable warning fields. And again, this is this is getting pretty detailed, putting the warning fields in. If you don't have your curb ramps designed, um, you know, this is obviously something you don't need. In this case, we are far enough along um, and there was a school nearby to the project. So pedestrian accommodations were important to the public and um, parents are concerned about with this roundabout being the first one in the area. They wanted to know how students are going to get to and from school. Um, so we wanted to show these so choose a yellow color close and refresh and now you can see those are added in so in this case it's just a yellow block so if you zoom in you're not gonna you're not gonna see the the uh, detectable warning field the actual little raised nubs that are on there um, if you you know if you had some sort of pedestrian project that was really zoomed in for some sort of critical crossing you could add that kind of detail in to put those nubs in by creating a um, a surface and blending that surface in that showed those nubs. But for something like this, that is way too detailed for what we were looking for. So now you can see just by importing a few coverage areas and that took, you know, 10 minutes or so. Um, we have a pretty decent looking rendering already um, of what the area looks like. Um, you know, drawing in the actual shapes, it's going to take probably three times as long as importing them. Um, it's one of those, depending on what kind of staff you have at your office. Um, if you have a, a co-op student or summer student, you might be able to have them draw in all the areas for you and save some time. Um, if you've done quantities already and you have a quantity drawing that has some of these shapes already in there, you may just be able to use those directly instead to save some time. Uh, so after that, now um, we're going to want to make sure we import pavement marking. As you can see, I mean, we got a good start here, but um, for the average public now, they're going to want to see the pavement marking to understand what's what's happening. So I've got another drawing with all the different pavement marking lines. So what I've done now is for any long lines, so you can see I've got the, the paving file turned back on. So I'll turn that off. You can see what I've done is traced over. So any any long line, it's a solid line. You can create a a uh, solid line that just traces over the top of it. Um, it. It'll be able to bring those in. So what I what I'll do is I'll create a all separate layer for four inch lines. In this case, we have 12 inch lines. But if you had an eight inch line, it's a solid line. You'd want to create that on a separate layer so that each line width is a separate layer as well as each color. So when we go to import them, we're going to import them based on not only the width but the color of the line. When you get to dash lines, InfraWorks doesn't like scaling the dashes to the, the dash patterns we use with Wistot. So the best way to do that is just to turn on your paving file or wherever your pavement marking is located. And what I'll do is I'll just trace a line that's approximated again because we're really zoomed in here. When we're zoomed out to what the rendering is, if this is off by half an inch or an inch, you're never going to know. So what I'll do is I'll just trace over the line and then I'll offset it and create a rectangle so we have approximately the correct spacing for any dash lines 
Um, and then the same thing in this case with the crosswalk, we have the continental style crosswalk. So we have a, a box around the outside of each piece, each bar of the crosswalk. And then we have the yield. So what you can do with the yield um, is that you can either use the WISDOT symbol and bring that in and just make sure that each piece is a closed polyline um, with each piece of text. And then the same thing, in this case, this is an 18 inch wide yield line. So the same same goes, we draw a line offset at nine inches on either side, make sure this is a closed polyline for each one. Um, so you can then, same with the median noses, you would just generate a shape for any of the coloring on the median noses. And in this case, we have corrugated median, so there's yellow in between the corrugations. So we have that as well. So you go through and add in all your pavement marking lines. So now what we'll do is similar to the, the materials for the roadway, we'll create a shape file. So again, we'll type in map export. And we've got a pavement marking and we'll just Actually, before we do that, let's isolate out a layer. So we want just the we want just the four inch solid white lines, so it's easier. Um, so we'll isolate those out. And we'll do map. So we'll just for now just add this in because I know the other ones are going to work on import. So now this will pop up and now we're dealing with lines. So with the object type, you'll want to type in line, select manually. Select all of them. So you'll see it'll list eight objects. So if you know how many objects you have, it's just good to check this and make sure that in this case, you know, you have eight. So that you selected all of them. You can select, you know, in everything on an entire layer or by object class. I just like to make sure I'm selecting all of them myself. And in this case, treat closed polylines as polygons is grayed out because we have a line, so you, you can't have the option to check that. So you click OK, it'll generate the shape file. You then repeat the same thing um, for all your other solid lines. Now when it comes to your um, ones that are going to be more as areas, so the dashed lines, when you can't export as a line, you're going to export all of those polylines as polygons. Um, so for these the white ones. In this case, I put all the dashed lines, all the words, all the crosswalk bars, all on one layer just to make the number of imports we have to do um, the least amount that we have to. So you would do the same thing again, map export. Um, okay, again, it would be the polygon, select manually. Under options, treat closed polylines as polygons. And you then repeat the same thing for the different widths of lines for white and for yellow and the yellow areas. So once you've done that, export them all out, you'd go back into InfraWorks. And now we need to import those lines into um, the model. So again, we have a shape file, so we'll import those. So we'll go back up, pavement marking. So in this case, we'll just do the we'll do the lines first. So we'll just do the four inch white first. So again, it pops up with no feature. So double click on it. We'll make these a coverage area, even though it's not an area, we still want to make these a coverage area. And so again, under the rule style, we'll click on the pencil icon and under color, we'll just default as white. And then before you hit close and refresh, you're going to want to go to the table. And this is this is the big difference between lines and areas. So under table, as you scroll down under coverage, there's a buffer. And so as soon as I click on it, it just says empty and the unit is feet. So you want to use it's going to create as a line. If you add a buffer, it's going to offset that line in both directions by the buffer you set. So in this case, it's a four inch line, which is 0 0.33 feet so we'll want to offset that by half of that which is 0 0.166 and we'll click close and refresh and you'll see now it's inserted those 
uh, um, onto the surface. And now this is where the layering becomes important because now you want to make sure that that's above your asphalt layer so that they show. Um, there are some other methods to import um, line work as well. To me, this is the one that seems to work the most consistently. So we'll want to repeat the same thing with our four inch yellow lines. Yellow. And we'll go to the coverage buffer, 0 0.166. Now it's added in the yellow solid four inch lines. And now we'll go to add in the 12 inch yellow lines for the diagonals and the median. Under the buffer. Again, now these are 12 inches wide, so we'll have 0 0.5 as our buffer. Close and refresh, and now you can see because of the different buffer, we have a different width of line. So now we have all of our solid lines. Next, we're going to want to import our coverage areas that'll have um, the words and the dash lines and the crosswalks. So again, we'll import a shape file. So I'll select white coverage areas. Double click. Change the type to coverage areas, the rule style, color, we'll select white. And in this case, because it's a, an area and not a line, we don't need to add the buffer. So we'll just click close and refresh. So now you can see it add in all, all the crosswalks, all the dash lines. And when, it, when it's brought in, you can't tell that this is a four inch coverage area that's an actual shape that we drew in and that this is a line. Um, for these dashes, you know, in this case, we didn't have a lot of dashes. Um, if you had a long, you know, if you, let's say you had like a six or an eight lane divided highway, um, you'd have to make those shapes for each one of those dashes. Um, so that's kind of the downside of this method. Um, you can use a, a barrier style um, within here. Um, it takes a while to set up. If you're doing a lot of these, it'd probably be worth the time to set that some custom barrier styles up. The other me other method would be then within Civil 3D, you could set up um, an, or an array that would then, you could easily add a dash every t every 50 feet. Um, that's 12 and a half feet long, as long as you've got a long straight road. If you've got curves, then you'd have to draw those in by hand, um, but you can use the array to, um, and then explode the array to try and generate those a little quicker rather than having to draw hundreds of um, little boxes. So now we've got the white areas in. We'll want to add in the yellow coverage areas. Click close and refresh. So now you can see it's added in the median noses. And then it's added in those areas. So now it's looking pretty good. Um, we've got all of all the different um, pavement marking lines that are in there. So the next thing is if we've generated um, all this, you can add three dimensional objects. So close this. There is within InfraWorks, there's a pretty decent uh, library of, of different things um, you can choose. So under 3D model, there's a whole bunch of different city furniture. So you can see it has different, you know, post office boxes and newspaper kiosks. I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of stock, trash cans, recycle bins, um, different various things they have. Um, under highway, there's some different guardrail and barrier types you can use. Um, vegetation, you can see there's a lot of different tree types. 
And this is probably the one that I use the most is the different tree types. There's also vehicles in here as well. And there's also um, houses as well. So the, the vegetation and the houses are probably the ones I use the most. Um, you can see under vehicles, there's just, you know, all sorts of different sedans and buses. So depending on how much detail you want to, you know, if, you know, depending on how much detail you want to put into the model, you could leave it just like this and not add, add any three dimensional objects to it. Um, and most people would probably be completely fine with how this rendering looks. Um, in this case, I'll always go into style editor. You can't add them from here, but usually what I'll do is make note of which ones we're looking for. Um, so we'll just go to add in a tree. So I can see like there's one that's just a, it's some sort of dark green. So I just know it starts T16. So what you can do then is go to the create tab under the environment ribbon. Um, there's a an icon for city furniture, so you can click and add that. Because um, if you type in just tree, you don't really get a whole lot. You get you get a few trees, but not many. Um, but because tree is not in the name, it's vegetation. See so if you just type in T16. Now you can get right to that tree we're looking for. So if you did. If you double click on it and then double click where you want the tree. So if you've got topo that you can see where all your trees are, that's great. You can use that. Um, otherwise, you can kind of use in this case, you could use the aerial photo and we can see, you know, it looks like there's a tree right here. And from looking at just like Google Street View or project photos, you could tell what, roughly what kind of tree it is. I mean, most people, you know, unless it's in someone's front yard and they're really concerned about it, they're probably not going to care if you put a maple or an oak those kind of things. So we'll just double click within the drawing and you can see it added a tree. Nice thing is if you hit escape, then it'll it'll pop it up and you can see like the purple box is going to be kind of the, the grip of where it's located. Um, in this case, it's, it's kind of snaps it right onto the surface. You can you can rotate the, the tree by selecting. If you select it, if you kind of hover over it, it'll turn you can you can change the angle of it. This arrow will allow you to change the size of it. So if you if you know it's a really big tree and you know it says 65 feet i don't know exactly how if that's perfectly accurate or not but again as long as it roughly looks scaled in your in your rendering that's all that really matters so you can go and you can add those in there's even if you click the drop down there's even ways of adding whole rows of trees and stands of trees if you've got like a long line of pine trees um, you can add all those in and you can change the spacing and the size of individual trees. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through and add a whole lot more furniture into this, but you can add in cars and people in as much detail as you want or as little detail as you want. That's the nice thing about this is you can you can really define how much detail you want to add. Um, when we did this for the public meeting, we kind of just added in some generic houses for the houses around there, and we added in all the trees that were going to remain. Um, we didn't add cars and everything else, but you could do that. Um, one other thing that we did add, though, was signs and light poles. And so what you can do with those is InfraWorks doesn't have a really good library of US MUTCD compliant signs. So what probably took the longest part of the whole rendering process was creating these signs. So to do that, um, I believe you can use Autodesk Inventor to do that. That's not part of the AECC collection that has InfraWorks and Civil 3D. So we don't have that as part of our package. But what I was able to do is just go into Civil 3D and you can draw 3D solids. So if you go to your workspace and you can switch to 3D modeling. And we aren't going to have time to draw um, a full one in here, but what you can do then is It'll change kind of your palettes up top. And what I'll usually do is either bring in, so I, you can just change the rotation of your view to the front view. And you can then go into either the Wistot sign library and import a sign block. Or what I've done, if there's not one in the sign library um, or it's a custom sign, what I've done is I've just gone to, just gotten, gone to the MUTCD taken a screenshot of the sign and made a JPEG out of it, inserted the JPEG and scaled the JPEG to the correct size. So this sign is one to one scale. So if this is a 24 by 30 sign, it's a two foot by three foot sign. 
you import that PDF in and you can just trace the line work over. Because again, with the rendering, if it's not exactly, you know, if this arrowhead isn't perfectly crisp or this radius isn't exactly perfect, no one is going to know as long as it looks okay. So what you can then do is create a series of three-dimensional objects. So in this case, But when you make them, the critical thing with any of the signs is as you make them, make sure that the, the sign has a little bit of a thickness. I usually make it you know, 0 0.02, 0 0.03 thick. But then any of the, then you can create a, in this case, it's a white, white background. But then any of the symbols and the border, you're going to want to make that at least 0 0.01 feet thicker of an extrusion. So you can use the extrude object for, for those shapes. You'd make a closed polyline and extrude those out. You want to make sure they're at least 0.01 thicker than the background so that when you group these all into one solid, that those all stand out. So you can, before you make them all as one big solid, when they're individual solids, you can assign a color out of the material library and you can add different, you know, either the yellow or the white or the green background. And then, that, and there's, we aren't going to have time for that with this um, video, but Jeff and Jerry Bartles both have really great videos on YouTube and on their blog um, on how to do things like this, not specifically signs. Um, that's where I got a lot of help when I've created these first videos. That they, they have some great videos of, in that case, they are creating um, like a, a building with a sign and some, like it was like a fast food restaurant. They, they created all sorts of different objects for you know, like a public information meeting rendering. Um, and you can use the same concepts they use to generate for creating some of those objects for doing science. Um, so again, if you've got a co-op student um, or summer student that you know has some time on their hands, and you're gonna, you know you're going to do a lot of these renderings, you could have them go through and create all the really commonly used. You know, this is a really commonly used signs, stop signs, yield signs, um, those kind of objects. Just so you have a library of them ready to go for when you're doing um, renderings. So once you create those you know i also just created a, a signpost so i just created a generic signpost and you can attach the sign to it and make them all so this is all one large 3d object and so then what you would do is create export this as an fbx file so if you click export and then create fbx you can create an fbx file of that sign um, and make sure to only pick that specific sign. So what, then what you can do with an InfraWorks is if you just open up your Windows Explorer and go to where the where your files are all kept. signs what you can do then is you can just find the fbx file file and just click on it in this case we have the r4-7 you can click on it and you just drag and drop so you can see that the copy sign pops up and it's just going to pop in and what you're looking for for an object type is city furniture and that one didn't import um, sometimes you got to play around with the scale of these. So it's showing up as not connected. Oh, we have to change the coordinate system. So we'll try that again. Oh, this is what we missed the first time. We want interactive placing as we want. So it's otherwise it places at zero, zero, zero. So double click on that. And you can see in this case it showed up super small. So sometimes they do, sometimes I've had them come in at scale. Um, so what you can do is you can just, again, you can adjust them to 
roughly the correct height. And you can rotate them. And you would then repeat the same process with all of your different signs. Um, if you've got custom objects, one thing I've done, like in this case, we had a, a fence that went along this parcel. So what we did was just made a 3D objects drawing. So what I did is I just made an, an extrusion of each fence post and created fences. And so these these have an X, Y, and a Z value. So I placed them on the, on the finished surface at the correct elevations and then made one 3D object and exported an FBX file of these. And then, and then because they were at, at a coordinate system, you would be able to drop then drop them into the proper location and they'd show. So if you've got signs or you've got multiple ones, I mean, you could actually go through and if you had a signing plan done, for example, you could insert each sign um, as a 3D object into a civil 3D drawing and place those all at specific locations and then import all of them at once. You could do the same thing if you had like a lighting plan or a signal plan for um, and you, you you could go through and you could make 3D objects of all the different monotube sizes and bring in the ones you need. Um, again, it's a matter of how much detail you want to provide to that rendering. Um, so now that we have this, we'll want to, the last step then is to go through and create the actual rendering you're looking to have. So what you can do then is just zoom around, find the direction you're looking for. I guess before that we would need to set our, um, go through and, and set the different time of the day. So under the Manage tab, if you go to Sun and Sky, you can see you can adjust the date and the time. Um, so you can see here there's a little bit of a shadow here because um, it's just defaults to April 1st in the middle of the afternoon. So what you can do is you can change your date. So depending on how much contrast, because if you have it at, right at noon, you're not going to get any kind of shadows that really show up. So it, just as an extreme example, we'll just slide this over and you can see as it comes to be towards the evening, you can make it completely dark. Um, but you can see you can you can create shadows. Um, so depending on how you want to show it, you can create a different shadow. So we'll just draw it to there and just leave it. So it's got a little bit of a shadow because having a little bit of contrast and having a little shadow just makes it look a little more realistic. So then the last step is to go and make the actual rendering. So we'll just we'll pick out uh, just an area here and then under the under the present share tab under present. You click create snapshot. So in this case, you would just go through and put a file location where you want it. And it's going to ask you for a resolution. So 800 by 600 is pretty small. Um, so depending on how detailed of a rendering you want, I mean, if you're putting it on a web page and you need to keep your, your page size down. Um, so, you know, in this case, we could we could go through and really make it super detailed. You click save and it's going to generate that snapshot. So now if we zoom to where Windows Explorer where that's located. You can see now it's a seven meg file. And it looks pretty clean. So if you're just loading it to a web page, you could leave it at this. What we've done in the past then for public meetings is if we want to print something at a 24 by 36 size, so it's an actual size that fits on a nice piece of foam core. We've then just imported this into a PowerPoint slide that's 24 by 36 and trimmed it. And you can you can add text with you know the Wist out of the city logo. You can put a project title on it, um, all those kind of things. Um, so you know, as an example, this is kind of the final product that we had when we did our public meeting. So you can see we had we had some trees, we had light poles, um, and grass, and some of the roundabout signs and some vehicles. Um, and that's we had. Um, and if there's any questions, just you know, type them in the chat bar and I'm more than happy to answer any questions.